forever. Dog. When I'm at my, my, my place of sort of just like, I'm cool with everything and not worrying, stuff just happens. And when I'm worrying, stuff still happens, but I'm not, I'm not as a, a in touch with how it's happening. You know what I mean? Like you can go, like, I guess my point is, there have been work experiences where like, oh, cool, I know what I'm doing. I know all these people. I know what the environment is. I'm just doing my thing. And then there are times I've gone into a work environment where I'm like, I'm doing my thing, but I have one eye on something else and I'm worried that this won't lead to that. Mm. And I'm not in the moment. No I'm, way to live. Yeah, terrible. Welcome to Household Faces, the podcast where a character actor interviews other character actors. I'm your host, John Ross Bowie. You might know me from The Big Bang Theory or Speechless or several episodes of the TV Land sitcom Retired at 35, which also featured George Siegel and Jessica Walter. Our guest is Brian Husky. Now, I've known Brian for close to 30 years. He and I came up at the Upright Citizens Brigade in New York in the 90s. We were in a sketch group together called Naked Babies the group that I cannot recommend Googling, with uh, Brian and I, Rob Cordry, Seth Morris. Um, we got headshots around the same time. We very much came up together. This is this is probably, this is definitely the oldest friend that I have had on the podcast. You know Brian from Veep, from a bunch of Seth Rogen uh, uh, projects about which um, we discuss my, my weird career envy. Um, you know him from a series of commercials for a fast food chain. We're going to discuss that and a terrific, terrific and relatively recent episode of The X-Files. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the road from indie rock to acting and a bunch of other things. This is really a good one, guys. Strap in. Please welcome Brian Husky. Brian Husky, thank you so much for uh, for joining us. Jonathan Ross Bowie. Not my name, but okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to mention right now that I've known Brian for a quarter century, and he still thinks I'm a Jonathan, not a John, but um, we make it work anyway. So um, your family decided just to lop off the extra letters and just go for short short name? Yeah, just went, uh, just J-O-H-N. Uh, it's, a, it's a family name, both my grandfather's. Oh, yeah? Yeah, but you are not Brian Husky. I'm James Brian Husky. You're James Brian Husky. Which infuriates my daughter. She's like, why don't you just go with your first name? Yeah, why like, don't you? I Most don't know. It's a, I, it may, might be a Southern thing because I've met a couple of other people. I'm from North Carolina. A couple of other people in the South are like, oh, yeah, my parents just went with the middle name. Either that or they'll combine them. Like my sister's name is Mary Elizabeth Husky, and everybody calls her Mary Beth. So. Okay. So um, I could have been Jimmy B. Jimmy, yeah. Or something so like that. So did they just start, they just called you Brian right out of the gate? Just Brian. You don't remember being called James or Jim or no, Jimmy? No, Only if, if I was in trouble. Oh, interesting. You know, okay. the full the full length name. We're going to get to your upbringing in a moment. Okay. Um, the show is called Household Faces, but we inevitably end up talking about people's voice credits as well. And as you mm -hmm. have a film in theaters right now, let's discuss Bob's Burgers. Mm-hmm. Um, I was I, I went to see it this weekend with my son and it um it's so charming and the jokes are great and the animations I mean I know it's all done on computers but it's it's nice to see something that is cell animation styled you know yeah. that looks sort of you know still kind of hand drawn even right. though I'm I'm sure there's all sorts of tricks that that are over my head what do you think is the secret to that show's appeal like why what distinguishes it from Simpsons or Family Guy or any of the other animated family sitcoms? I know it's interesting because, like, if you watch the first season, it's pretty, like, dark. Yeah. And and brutal. There are some, like, mean jokes in there, like, from, from the, from the get-go. Yeah. The first season. And then I, I, think it's, I think it's the result of an entire group of writers and creator who have been working together for, at this point, 13 years, who have all – started to have kids and all kind of grown up in as parents together. And so there's been a softening, I think. That's what struck me yeah. is like how warm and gentle and accepting the family is to each other. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, because the kids are, are ostentatiously weird yeah. and, and, but there's no like, um, you know, you don't have i uh, I'm, I'm drawing the blank on, uh, on the, um, 
on the bully from The Simpsons. I'm drawing the blank on his okay. name. <laughs> yeah, that guy. You're like that character doesn't really exist in on on the show per se. Yeah, the closest is played by Kurt Braunahler. Yeah, um, I, th- I can't remember his character's name, but he is sort of like Louise's um, nemesis. Right, he's like the older teen. But even then, they will always build in kind of an opportunity for Louise to give him a pass or see that he's doing this because he's vulnerable or scared or whatever. So they do, I think they do a good job of like people's behavior is like put into action by something else. You know what I mean? Yeah. They go to people's root causes. Yeah. Yeah. How did, how did regular size Rudy come to you? I, they just asked me to do it. And I, but I do think I was like, I think they just heard about me, but I do think it was one of those things like, well, it probably didn't hurt that Lauren and I's, our kids took a swimming class together (laughs) And so there's one conversation. Lauren uh, Bouchard. L- Lauren Bouchard. Yeah, okay. At, um, and it was through our f- mutual friend, Scott Armstrong. Mm-hmm. Like, he had the pool, and everybody would go there. And uh, maybe it was just a conversation. It was like, uh, Brian's an actor. It's like, oh, yeah, I know. I know your stuff. And then, I don't know. And then I got a call. I don't know. I mean. I love L.A. I love connections. But I don't. This is one of the things I am very bad at in this business. I am not. Any time that I have actively tried to network, network, move the ball down the field, sort of like get in someone's face and remind them, it just – I might as well just drive by their house and hurl poop at their door because I just feel like it just never pays off. So this is one I was on a – I wasn't trying. It just was a thing of like maybe the universe is like, yeah, this, you should maybe go well, do this. That, that, let that be a lesson to all of us. Hey. Let that be a camera lesson one? to yeah. all of us. Yeah, that's your camera. Yeah. Um, the um, – uh, well, that's fantastic. That's yeah. great. And I feel like that's a, a, a very interesting trend in your career that we will you – know, Brian and I have known each other for honestly close to 30 years. And I will say that you and I – you are a huge part of me becoming – the performer I am. What? Yeah, because I didn't do it before we started to do classes at UCB. Well, okay, but here's I mean, the thing. Hang on. Band, band. Okay, well, no, that's the thing. Is that, So Brian and I, aside from being friends for close to 30 years, have a remarkably similar origin story in yeah. the sense that um, we graduate from a perfectly reasonable but maybe not super impressive college totally. with an English degree. Mm-hmm. Um do several years in a band with varying degrees of success. You made a little bit more of a footprint than I did. Mm. Um, And then in our very high 20s or 30 or so, end up in improv at Upright Citizens Brigade in New York, which is not how we met. We met before that, but we ended up taking improv around the same time and decided, oh, we're going to be actors. Right. Starting amongst a bunch of people who are like, oh, yeah, I started doing regional theater at 12. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, So it's very for me, it was this thing of like, oh, my God, then I shouldn't be here. I should not be. I'm just going to fake this. Oh, my imposter syndrome has never really gone away. But it's but yeah, I mean, because we started we all started. We met through Rob Corddry. Um, Rob had been um, uh, been doing Shakespeare in black box theaters all around New York, yeah. and I'd seen him do that, and I thought he was great, and I still think he was great at that. But he was looking to push himself a little bit. I was looking to – my band had broken up. I was going through a crushing depression, decided I was going to try improv. Um, what – was the thing that pushed you into improv. <laughs> You'd moved to New York to, to study photography. I, yeah, I'd moved to New York to go to the International Center of Photography. So I did that for a year. And I I think I kept I kept wanting to sort of declare the thing that was going to be my life path. And each time I always I, I kept feeling like but this isn't it but I'm, I've declared it. I kept dating and then marrying the wrong woman, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so when I just wanted someone to say, you should do this because it's the only thing I've always like been fascinated by truly and wanted to do was like some kind of comedic performing and our creation and stuff. Were you embarrassed to tell people that? Yeah, Me because too. it's Me like, too. and I mean, I, I feel like this is my redundant story that people I tell, but it's like, I have a framed picture uh, or framed speech that I wrote in second grade where I, it's called future comedian. And I said, when I grow up, I want to be a comedian. 
Uh, I want to do like funny shows. My heroes are Don Knotts, Tim Conway. I don't want to be a hack like Bob Hope because I know some people write his jokes for him. How old were you? Second grade. So Second what, grade, and you're calling out Bob Hope for being a hack. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's beautiful. So I, I'd probably misogynist. I probably recognize that. Early yeah, on, sure. You know? Yeah, uh huh. <laughs> um, that's magnificent. Yeah. I have a, a somewhere in my house. It's not framed. It should be. We had gone to the circus with my second or third grade class and we were given what was in hindsight clearly just busy work mm -hmm. um what job would you want at the circus and i <laughs> said i said clown but not because i desperately wanted to be a clown just all the other jobs looked really dangerous <laughs> <laughs> because i want to give the gift of laughter i was like no these are all like i'll get eaten alive yeah. i'm gonna break my neck um yeah there's no hr uh, consequences or anything yeah really yeah I, I i couldn't um uh but i think I, so, like with your question i think it i i needed someone and this is a little embarrassing to admit but at the same time it's it's not because i i basically just needed someone to say you can do this yeah, i same, recognize same in, same i recognize in you that you can do this you're not recognizing this in you but you do it all the time who was that person for you that was rob cordry yeah, rob cordry yeah. that was literally rob cordry because yeah. he was a, because before we did our sketch group called naked babies in Providence sketch there was an earlier iteration that was our friend Jeb Barrier right. that he was in the um, Shakespeare, touring Shakespeare company with, and Mike Lombardi, who he had gone to college with. Right. And we got together, would write sketches and stuff, and just Rob said, like, I, oh, it, I'm skipping over something. He was also doing this comedy group called Third Rail Comedy. That's right. Rob Cordry was doing Third Rail Comedy, which, because um, they were so, um, they were like the third rail on a subway. They were dangerous. So dangerous. You could they get were, electrocuted were, watching this comedy. You could. You could. You could You're die. Like, you could fucking die. That's a good selling point. You will die if you watch this comedy. Yeah. Um, so he just would basically said, like, you're funnier than this sketch group I'm in. <laughs> we should try to do something. And yeah. I think the other thing is, like, I think Rob was a little, uh, uh, intrigued by my uh because i feel like i introduced him to indie rock yeah you know what i mean and he was a little intrigued by this kind of maybe it was just being in a band or like a north carolina approach to things but he liked that it was there was a little bit of a weirdo creativity that he i don't think he was getting feeling like he was getting with the other stuff he's doing. well your band bicycle face has an uh, you're you're it's weird because you're tight as hell you were all good musicians, but there is a sense of outsider art to it yeah. at the same time. Not quite like Daniel Johnston they're making it up as they go along, because again, the 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 chops are there, but there is a a bold defiance of convention in the work. Yes. It's very hard to classify a bicycle face. Yeah. I don't automatically hear your influences when I listen to you guys. It's a weird it's a weird It's mishmash. a weird like mishmash of country and prog and, yeah, yeah. and and a bunch of different other things with a certain punk energy, yes, granted. But um yeah, I think there was something very alluring about you to Cordry. Yeah. And to me too, for that matter, because my band was was much more straight ahead garage punk. Um but let's talk about bands for a moment yeah. though. Um what have you taken from your time in a band and brought to acting, if anything. Hmm. I think it it is uh, well separate from acting. It I think being in a band helped me transition into doing improv because I recognized the same playing field of here is a very supportive large group community, a scene, a scene, okay. and then within that scene are individual groups that are competitive against each other and also supportive of one another and also admire each other's work right and 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 it is in in service of something larger which is music and or in improv comedy you know what i mean and we were talking about at this point the the and i don't mind using this word legendary chapel hill scene of the 90s mm -hmm. right so yeah. it's you guys and archers of loaf and super chunk right and and i'm i'm blanking there's a bunch of amazing finger men. pipe uh, and now it just sounds like a big enough. Yeah, like yeah. yeah, yeah. um, I know uh, you had a I know you, train wreck. Uh, you uh, were you were in a you, you had friends in a band called Spatula. Spatula. Yeah, yeah. sure, sure, sure. Who is now um, a guy named uh, it's still has always been named Chuck Johnson, but now he's gone from doing that to do this doing this really 
like soothing atmospheric sort of pedal steel guitar um, keyboard stuff. Oh, interesting. It's amazing. It's oh, so really? Amazing. Yeah, it is sort of. The does he do it under, under the name Spatula or does he go to no, Chuck just, Johnson? No, it's just Chuck Johnson. But there's just like that, two. There's a. There's a there's a right wing pundit named Chuck Johnson. There's a left wing pundit yeah. named Chuck Johnson. There's also a country musician named Chuck Johnson. Jesus Christ! That he said has ruined his Google searches. Oh shit! I'm so, so sorry. Yeah, so. <laughs> oh wow! But then, as far as like with the acting, I think um, I think if anything, it's just get, it, I, performing because we would spend an a, a, an inordinate amount of time just talking on the mic, and people would say, "Shut the fuck up." play music no we are we we would leave time we would actually put banter on the set list yeah we yeah. would write down banter on the set list because yeah. we knew we were going to end up just talking while we tuned or just to amuse each other right yeah so i guess i mean i think the only thing it w- one of the things it gave me was um a willingness to sort of like i'm going to see what happens when i do this mm-hmm. it took it, it it took away a little bit of like preciousness as to um you won't know unless you try that that yeah. I will say, and I think improv helped me that way too. If I had started with just traditional acting classes, which I've done very few of because I'm terrified of them, okay, um, I don't think I would have jumped in as readily. Oh, absolutely. There's no way I would have. Well, first off, I never would have put myself in an acting class first, yeah, because that would have meant a an admission that I had wanted to. That would have been me coming out of my my cocoon and admitting that I wanted to be an actor. Improv, you could right. always be like, you know, it's a lark, whatever. Yeah. You know, it's still pretty cool. Screw him. Whatever. Yeah. You know, I'm going to show up hungover. Big deal. Um, right. And there was a way of sort of – there's a dilettante aspect to starting with improv, I think, um, that was crucial for me, which I needed. Yeah. And then when someone in class was like, oh, are you an actor? And I said, no. And then I was like, huh. huh. And I'll call her out, Celia Bresak. Celia Bresak was the one who said that to me. Mm-hmm. God love her. Mm-hmm. Um, she used to coordinate all the classes, and she assumed that I was an actor. Yeah. Didn't ask, are you an actor? She said, so you're an actor. And that was my oh, that's good. That was my moment in, in level one class of like, oh, shit, maybe I, yeah. maybe I can do yes, this. Yes, I am. <laughs> So when do you make the big – you're like 30 when you get headshots, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. late, dude. That's very late. Yeah. It's very late. And I thought <laughs> I thought that I constantly was like, God, I'm so late in the game. I'm, I'm trying – fucking already lost your hair, right? You've already gone bald pretty I'm much. I'm like – okay, well, this is a big – this is – Have I touched your time li- No, no, but no. the timeline of my hair is very interesting of – of like I've had a lot of people say like oh yeah you're already bald at that point and I I always I- immediately get very defensive like no I had a good I had a tuft and it was pretty much filled I in apologize. and stuff I apologize but yeah. the good okay. thing is I have to remind myself is like people perceive me as looking the same way for 25 years we talk about this on the podcast all the time yeah. the bald actors look middle aged when they're 25 yeah. And then continue to look that way until they are put in the ground. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and you, like, Tobolowski is 20 years older than me. Or is he? Who yeah, knows? I know. Anybody's guess. Totally. Um, uh, so you get headshots at 30. And did that feel like, okay, I guess we're doing this? I think so. I think, yes, definitely getting headshots was a commitment. Financial, if any financial commitment at that point was sort of like, oh my God, I don't have any money to spend, but I'm going to yeah. spend it on this. And I think the other commitment was <laughs> saying to my very weary parents at that point that I was switching careers again, yeah. that they're like, oh, so we paid money for you to go to college and then pay for money for you to go to this art school. And now you're doing this. So they, I think that at that point they were like, you're just always going to be like, I'm just ready for you to be a poet next and just give up. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, here's the thing, you know, because you were and, – and we won't spend too much time on your origin story, but you were an English major. And on this podcast, English major is the second most popular major mm-hmm. without – I mean, a close second to theater. Well, it's the closest – because I, I also was – when I was in college, I was like, I, I want to do comedy writing. Okay. So I was sort of – and 
now I'm now I sort of realize like, oh, that's me wanting to be adjacent to it, but not committing to the thing I I want to do, but don't think I can do, which is acting. Right. Uh huh. Right? Uh huh. Um, and because again, writing is vulnerable, but it isn't your face. Yeah. Yeah. You're yeah. putting yourself out there, but you're not putting your body out there. Right. Yeah. I get that. And then once I started be started doing the English major program, I was like, oh, I'm not that interested. I like talking about ideas. I'm not a big I'm not a big reader at all. Um, and I found writing to be painful and annoying. It's hard work. Yeah, it's really it's hard, hard work. work. Yeah. Um, so, but I, you know, again, as I, I was just like, well, I this is my declared major, so I guess this is my life. I will either go towards like being a comedy writer or I'll be an English teacher. I was going to say, did you think of, you, you thought about teaching for a little bit? I, I mean, every, of, all I, English majors think about teaching. I anyway. thought about it in, in with the greatest resignation. It was sort of like that. That was like, again, I could always blank. I, yeah. Or yeah. I, or change the sentence. Like I will probably end up. Oh, fuck. <laughs> I bet this is, I leading. apologize to all the English teachers who are listening <laughs> to this. I, hey, everybody's I, got a different, everyone's got a different, path. Got a different you, path. Yours is a noble profession. Yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, no, I, I get that. There's a, um, uh, yeah. It's one of the reasons why it's hard to get a job as an English teacher because everyone thinks that everyone gets yes. their degree and it's like fuck it I'll teach yeah. you know and so there's like it's a uh, it's very much a seller's market uh, getting a teaching job in English and, I, and then the other thing is uh, one of the now I recognize this as fear but I used to be it, it was it took a lot for me to step across the threshold of something if I didn't feel like on the other side was an environment or a group of people who will accept me. So that worked out for me with music. That worked out for me with photography. But when I went and looked at the communications department at this college, I went to UNC at Greensboro. Greensboro right? yeah. um, everyone was just kind of bad mouthing like how that the program wasn't that great and the, the, the guy in charge of it was kind of a joke. And mm. so I just had judgment of it. Um, and that allowed me to be, play it safe and be like, well, I don't have to. It's probably like all that's all all programs are and stuff. Because I had looked at going into going to Emerson. I, I got into Emerson. Oh, yeah. Have we never talked about this? That's no, crazy. I got I into Emerson, so. but I didn't want to go. They didn't have an English major. Right. And I didn't want to go to from one city to New York, from New York City to Boston. I wanted to try something yeah. in a smaller, like traditional college town. I, but I, I got I, in and I was thinking of it because I had a girlfriend at the time who was in at Tufts. You should totally make decisions based That's, on whoever you're dating at 18. That was completely, it was my high school girlfriend that was continuing into, and that was a big part of my not experiencing college early was like obsession with that. But the other, but I wanted to go because Stephen Wright went there. Oh, yeah, that's and I was right. Really into Stephen and Spalding Gray, actually. Yeah. Who I, who I feel like you should be a fan, even if you're not. Yeah, I, I liked his stuff. I yeah, recognize okay, it. Right. Cool. All right. Um, but I, I don't know. It's interesting. I, I wonder what would it what would have happened if I had gone there. Very easily, I think I could have been overwhelmed by it. You know, like as I look back on how I got to where I am, I needed like a lot of like kind of long, slow baby steps. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but everybody's got their timeline, I guess. You were of the UCB community in New York that we came out of, and we both started taking classes in '98. You were – there was a wave of people who moved out to L.A. around 05 yeah. when the L.A. theater opened. And you were kind of at the tail end of that wave. Was that, again, sort of like I really want to make sure there's a cushion for me to yeah. land on? Okay. Yeah, I did not want to go until I had uh, representation. Okay. Because I feel like you had representation before that. No, I didn't. That's I had weird. like a commercial rep. I had commercial rep, and but I wasn't getting a legit rep. And it wasn't until Jason Manzukis and I had written a, a couple of movies, and we wrote one that we pitched to Paramount, and then that got us a writing. Well, how'd you end up getting pitching to Paramount if you didn't have? He had a, he had representation. He had he, representation, and then again, our friend Scott Armstrong had helped us okay. a little bit. Like he, I see, been like. I see. referred us to someone. Oh, great. Um, so, yeah, it was I, – I just didn't want to – because it felt like it would taken me a long time to get to a certain point in New York. I didn't want to start from zero again. Oh, interesting. I, I didn't have it in me. 
Like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm very aware of like when my well is kind of low. <laughs> and, right. And I was like, I just, I can't. You don't have the reserve, the ego reserve, reserve tanks yeah. to, to go out there. But the um, flip side of that is like, I came out here because, <laughs> so like, oh, I got a rep. So everyone must know about me. I'm coming out to, coming out to LA and I would go around these to do auditions and stuff. And I'd be like, I don't feel like the response, no one, I mean, everybody's really nice compared to New York, but I just don't feel like I'm getting the kind of like traction that I had built in my head would happen once you get an agent moved to LA. I just figured like, oh, the agent means you are now in the industry and everyone's like, oh, Brian, yeah, bring him in. I've heard so much about him. No, there's a few different steps. There's a few different, uh, uh, I wanna, as long as you're mentioning uh, Scott Armstrong so much, just for the listener at home, um, Scott came up with us at UCB. Mm -hmm. We used to do a show, a movie improv show called Feature Feature with him. Uh, That was was, uh, Brian, myself, Mm -hmm. Rob Corddry, Dinah Moe, Will Burson, Oscar nominee Will Burson. Yeah, Andy Secunda. Andy Secunda and uh, Jamie Denbo, um, who's, who's, uh, who, uh, is my wife? Beer. Yeah, is my wife and yeah. my baby mama. One half of your improv show. Is One half of my improv show more, as well. More importantly. Yeah. Um, but so Scott was, and then Scott uh, wrote Road Trip. He wrote the second Hangover movie. He's a he's a, a, a he was the first to get like big credits. I mm-hmm. feel like from our immediate friend group. Yeah. Um, but so so you moved to to L.A. and it from the outside, you started to get a lot of like good small gigs pretty quickly yeah i think and this is all hindsight i'm sure it didn't feel like that at the time but in hindsight yeah it it did feel like because again there was a scene already here that you had a place to perform right out of the gate casting directors were coming to that place right out of the gate Mm. so there wasn't it wasn't um a complete uh you weren't completely a fish out of water Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, what were some of those? Actually, we'll actually this gets us in in good with a, a, another line of questioning. I nice. feel like pretty shortly after that, you booked Super Bad, right? Yes. And I would say meeting Allison Jones was one of my like career goals. You know what I mean? Well, Allison Jones is the casting director who, if all she ever ever did was cast the Freaks and Geeks pilot and the Arrested Development pilot, she'd, be, she'd have a place in the Pantheon. Right. But she's done so much more than that. But she's if you really think about what I just and... said and the people she has broken, I that sounds bad, uh, yeah. uh, whose career she she's has birthed. boosted, <laughs> the, uh, the people she's beaten up, um, it's astonishing. You know, so yeah. she's she's uh, you know it's Seth Rogen and James Franco and and uh, Michael Sarah and and so on. Will Arnett. Um, so you meet. Allison Jones, she comes to see a show at UCB I, or no? I'm trying to think how that got. That might have been the one thing that my my uh, acting agent got for me. No, I think I got that uh, honestly through uh, our mutual uh, manager. Oh, at, okay. At Prince Paul Young. Okay, like, okay. That was the thing. I was like, please, I want to have a meeting with her, um, and I did, and it it went great, and she was really sweet and lovely, and then. She just started to bring me in for different stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and then she would also bring me in to to read with people increasingly. And so... Oh, interesting. Yeah. She'd have you as a reader for other people's auditions. Yeah, she had oh, me read. wow, that's a valuable skill. Oh, it was great. And so the probably the biggest thing that happened was she had me come in and read for... Uh, uh, McKay for the casting of Step Brothers. Okay. So I was getting to come in, like I read with like Catherine Hahn and uh, Adam Scott, and oh. I got to see these people come in and do their auditions, yeah. you know? And then they would also say like, and Brian's going to improvise with you. And so we would just do the script and let it kind of go. And so I was getting to sort of exercise my stuff. Right. And that led to me getting a, a, a nice scene in Step Brothers. Where you're, where you're one of the guys who interviews um, uh, Will and, and John. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, and so, and then McKay had me do some Funny or Die stuff that he had written, uh, that he directed me in and stuff. So it was, it was early stuff that like gave my very terrified inner being some, some confidence. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. Because I still f- felt incredibly green about being in the environment of being on camera. You know what I mean? Interesting. It You've really... done a ton of commercials by that point. I know. I know. And I think that it says so much mm-hmm. for what our brains can do to us as far as like the, the, the narrative that we can 
tell ourselves it is happening and then what's actually happening you know like and i and that just speaks of like i just was a little nervous and uh, didn't have like i didn't i didn't build up my reserves of confidence so it was just enough to kind of but the weird thing is like I think sometimes like that, that little sort of like, oh my God, I could teeter off of this high wire any, any second helped me. Well, I've seen you use it. Yeah. I've seen you use a certain nervous energy and turn it into exactly what the character needs. And we will get mm. to that in a moment. Interesting. Um, but what did you learn from watching other people? Some of whom, and I've heard, I don't want to get into the names of who didn't get gigs on Step Brothers, <laughs> yeah. but I've heard some names. Yeah. And... And there's some really fucking good people who, for whatever reason, just didn't get that job. What yeah. do you learn from experience like that so early in your time in L.A. to watch people who were quasi-established not get a job? I guess I just learned that it is it it is about the part, that yeah. there's something. And it, it I guarantee you I will forget this the second I audition for the next thing. <laughs> given, given. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I, I, can, I can preach it to everybody else, but no one can give themselves their own advice around this but yeah. it is a thing of like they would leave like oh my god that was so funny but then hearing adam talk about like adam mckay adam mckay talk about sort of like well he so funny but there's something this this sort of element doesn't fit in with this other element of of who i think this other character is and then once they have that character chosen it's how they sort of fit in with each other and there's there is just a weird I don't know. It's it's if we, if we go back to the band analogy, yep. it is sort yeah. of like you know, you're picturing you two but you have a different singer. Like what does that do? Right. You know, it right. really changes or you have that singer but you have a totally different guitarist. Like it it it's a it's it's trusting that the director and creators will have an understanding of like how these things are going to play out in in the long run with each other right you know what i mean right and there's a sense also to go back to the band thing there's a sense of like look that's a perfectly great guitar sound mm -hmm. it does not mesh with what the rest of the band is doing yeah you yeah. know that's fantastic that you're using the flange but we don't you know the the rest of us are doing just a, a straight ahead garage thing and yeah. that doesn't you're you've got chops for days but that just doesn't fit with what's going on right now yeah and i think that sort of like to put it into like you know, almost strict musical terms helps a great deal. Mm -hmm. And you just, you, you stop taking it quite so personally, I think. Yeah. I, I mean, I think I, I think there's a part of me that still takes it personally because I want to be a part of it. So the, oh, well, so, given, given. so, so the person, so the, ex there's a, f at its worst, there's a feeling of exclusion. Mm -hmm. But that again is, is thinking that everyone is, it, that they're throwing a dinner party. But it's like they're trying to create something. They're doing it's a business. It's a business, you know. And so, but it is. But it's a business that is a fucking dinner party. It's like, it, oh my god, this will be so much fun. Uh, I can't go. You know, it, because you've been so candid and vulnerable, I will be so candid and vulnerable. There was a period of time there where I was so painfully jealous of how mm. much Seth Rogen loved you. <laughs> so painfully jealous because oh, wow. I fell in love with Seth Rogen. Like the night Freaks and Geeks aired for the first time, oh, yeah. I was home sick from uh, Feature Feature because oh. it was a Saturday night show. Yeah, and I I was like I don't feel well. I don't, I don't have an improv show on me tonight. I'm gonna I'm gonna sit this mm -hmm. one out. And I watched that pilot and I was like, oh, this guy's a fucking genius. He's great. Right. And then like eight years later, you're working with him consistently, and for a while it bothered the hell out of me. Wow. And then I realized that everyone's on their own path, and you you turn fifty, and you're just sort of like. Compare and despair, John. Just yeah. do your own thing, for the love of God. But yeah. let's talk for a moment about how deeply fond Seth Rogen is of you. He, you, you, you're the least famous person <laughs> in This Is the End. Yeah, yeah. I'm, you have I, a, you have lines, but and it's a pivotal scene. You're the one. You're the guy who sticks his head into the house yeah. and and and, uh, begs them not, and and begs them to not 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 let you sit out there and die. Right, and I promise them. Uh, sexual favors respected blowjobs all around yeah yep. and they behead you mm -hmm. and which one beheads you is it jonah uh i can't remember okay yeah but you get beheaded yep. and you had a model of the other thing i was jealous if you got a model of your head which was awesome yeah, yeah. <laughs> terrifying process but great to have. Yeah, yeah 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 great to have exactly and um, i could have bought it on ebay someone sent me a link and they're like you should buy this and i was like yeah i don't know i think that's weird <laughs> oh i bought it 
I oh, keep you it next, yeah, <laughs> I keep it next to my bed. I yeah. do things to it. Yeah, I, um, I figured you're sort of working through some stuff. That's like not that. just my shit. That again, the jealousy was real. Um, <laughs> the um, but so it, it's so neat because he 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 uses you and he plays to your strengths again as someone who's got sort of a desperate neediness like that character in this mm-hmm. is the end that kind of if he first saw you as this sort of neophyte to Los Angeles yeah then he has used that to great effect mm-hmm. you know as like uh Seth Rogen's nervous co-worker in neighbors right you know it, it he's used that aspect of Brian I think very wisely through and he's also let you do some range stuff you you have that great thing is the uh as the bank teller in uh, Disaster Artist. Right. I love that moment, actually. And that was in Preacher. I don't know if that... Uh, oh, that's right. Pile of Preacher. That was, that was really fun. Cause yeah. Was like a, an actual... But again, that is that... It, it, it's interesting you're pointing that out because I had never been, a, like, aware of that. But that character also was this kind of needy, sort KG, of like... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Acknowledge me, accept me kind of thing. And it... I mean, it's so funny you say that because with... Within that acceptance, I had great sort of like I had a great neediness to advance within their their circle, their sphere of sort of like kingmakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, I mean? sure. And I mean, there was a while there where they were. I mean, they, I, I thought the term frat pack was not cool because they were all of those guys were way too beta to be frat brothers. Yeah, you know? yeah, totally. But uh, yeah. it, they got called that briefly, and I was like, that's a horrible misnomer. That doesn't fit at all. No, but they're like the gamers club. Or yeah, something I know like these fucking dungeon masters. Are you kidding yeah, me? But um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, there was a while there where like that was they were the the alpha and omega of American comedy. Yeah. And did you feel like, hmm. Did you feel like you wanted to go further in that? Yeah. Oh wow. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody's ever satisfied, man. It's really interesting. I mean, because there was there was a moment they were like, "Hey, do you have any scripts we can check out?" And I was like, "Oh yeah," and I had a few things like, and I gave it to them to check out, and then I didn't hear anything, and I was just like, "Oh god, oh no, they hate me." And you know, full disclosure, there was there was a a time there where. I jokingly said to to them like, yeah, it feels like everything you put me in, you kill me, and they're like, yeah, it's true. We like kill you and everything. We just bring you in, kill you, and I think I joked about it too much. Oh fuck! <laughs> where they're like, all right, hey man, take it easy, um, and I don't know. Again, that is that that is that thing of when I'm at my. I, my place of sort of just like I'm cool with everything and not worrying stuff just happens and when I'm worrying stuff still happens but I'm not I'm not as a uh, in touch with how it's happening you know what I mean like you can go like I guess my point is there have been work experiences where like oh cool I know what I'm doing I know all these people I know what the environment is I'm just doing my thing and then there are times I've gone into a work environment where I'm like I'm doing my thing but I have one eye on something else and I'm worried that this won't lead to that. Mm. And I'm not in the moment. No I'm, way to live. Yeah. No way to live. Terrible. And so easy. Easiest trap in the world in yeah. this business. Yeah, yeah. And because there's a a myth of um there's a myth of advancement, I think, in this business in the sense that we we all think that like we're on some sort of partner track or something, yeah. you know? Yeah. Like I, eventually by this age, I really should be partner and that's not how this business yeah. works. Yeah, yeah. And it, we've been doing the gig economy for literally millennia <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and need dollars. to, yeah, need to accept that. Um, but it's interesting regardless because, you know, you, you've, it, perception is reality to a certain extent. You've got a great career. Yeah, it's totally true. You know? And it, and it is just that, it is that repositioning of something. If you're looking at something this way, uh-huh. and you're like, oh, this is ugly. I hate the way it is. And you just kind of come around the side. It's like, oh, okay. The lighting is much better on my career. And I see all these aspects of it. But when I lock into what is not happening, or what I don't have, or a fear of like what's not going to come, mm-hmm. it it is very – it can be a very negative thing. And yeah. then you just have some objectivity that is very hard to do. I think everyone is, it's hard when, when you're dealing with your own existence to just be like, let's pull out a little bit and see it from let's the- Let's widen out and yeah. you know, look at look at where we, and also just to look at like, 
you know, that that sense of like, God, if I if I don't get a fucking tiny like three line bit on Conan this month, yeah. I will not pay rent. Yeah. You know, which is where we started in mm-hmm. 98, 99, like desperately hoping that Celia, Cecilia Pleva from uh, the casting director yeah. at Conan would call us yeah. with um, some random bit that would, you know, at least cover our utilities. Totally. And to be at a place where, you know, nobody's driving around in a Jaguar, but we're doing okay. I will say I had a, in retrospect, I had a different experience in terms of survival starting out because right at the two years into us, you know, proclaiming we will be actors and and endeavoring that my, my mother passed away and, and and then prior to that, my father passed away. So I came into inheritance, which I, Oh, interesting. Which I, when I got it, I told myself, I will, I will not try to rely on this. I will try to rely on this as little as possible and try to prove that I can do this by making money acting. Right, right. So, and I did, and I started to do it, but there's always this thing in me where I was like, but I have a cushion. Interesting. So I, I wonder how much- Taking that fear out. Taking that fear out either helped me and then conversely kind of stigmatized it a little bit. I was like, well, if- Every you know, like every job I got was a, a was proof that I should be doing this. All right. Taking away a survival thing, and I think if I'd had a survival thing, it just would have been like I don't know, whatever. Give me, just let me do it. Yeah, Great. yeah, yeah. It would have taken away a little bit of the, some kind of uh, pressure. I think I was putting on myself. Interesting. You know I mean? Yeah. Interesting. I, I mean, but I mean, you know, I mean, I yes, you came into an inheritance. I, I, I'm not. I, I don't think you. Um, you know, inherited a, a, a sixty-acre estate or anything. No, you know? but it was yeah. enough to, in in that playing field that we were all in, where yeah. everybody was like, "Oh man, scrapping for a commercial, scrapping for a Conan bit." There was something that I had a little bit of like, "I'll be okay if I don't get these things," but I really want to get these things because the larger, the the bigger issue was like, I really need to get these things so I can keep chipping away at this. This idea that I shouldn't be doing this, and so every if there was a time when you had to dip into that inheritance fund, did that feel like a a, a small defeat? Maybe. I okay. mean, I don't. I you know, I don't have a, a a memory of going to the bank and bursting into tears and being like I'm a failure. <laughs> right. <laughs> but here's your check, sir. Hey, sir, get out, please. But but I think it was sort of there a little bit. Interesting. You know I mean? Interesting. <laughs> As long as we're we're talking about deceased parents, you um, <laughs> you do uh, you do the darkness underneath Americana very well. Thank you. Can you talk? Tell me a little bit about Mister Neighbor's House. Sure, Mister Neighbor's House was um, there were two uh, thirty minute specials I did for Adult Swim. Uh, we had originally done it as a pilot, uh, fifteen minute pilot. I did it with Jesse Falcon and Jason Manzukis. We wrote it together. Uh, we pitched it to Cordry, who had some had a like a dangling open deal at Adult Swim for right. his children's From hospital children's day. Hospital, yeah. Excuse me. Um, and it was just a thing. It was like a bit that we came up with uh, just after a show. We used to do a show on Friday nights called Soundtrack, and we were just talking about how messed up. 1970s early 80s kids tv show was tv yeah. programming was mm-hmm. just like had this like whoa this is especially the more regional it was the more yeah like, the smaller the lower the budget the weirder and more disturbing the quality of like what they were trying to do was and so from that it just it was basically just sort of like oh it'd be cool to see husky in a in a fucked up kid show in a cardigan yeah. but my thing was like i don't want to i feel like with adult swim that they a lot of their stuff was just let's be as weird as we can, f- just for this because we can edgy for the sake of edgy. Yeah, and I wanted to sort of have, I wanted to have, and this is, came from improv. I wanted to have some basis in 
reality, some genesis as to why this weirdness is occurring, and we're going to investigate what that is. Okay. So really, the show ostensibly is like a David Lynch-like um, show that may or may not be taking place in the mind of an insane person. Well, there's an incredible moment in the first special where you look over, you look right into the camera, and then from your POV, we see the camera, and behind it is just this aching void. Yeah. That is hilarious and bone-chilling, <laughs> like the best David Lynch. Yeah moments yeah. so i think that comes across yeah and then yeah it's really dark like and then the second one i think is even darker yeah yeah and i love it i like i love it so much and i'm really i was really heartbroken that we couldn't do a third one because right. i sort of had like i knew where i wanted to go with it and everything but i i've always uh i've always really liked really dark comedy yeah yeah. Yeah. I've just always really liked What was the stuff that you were into when you were a kid, when you were, because you mentioned Don Knotts and Tim Conway. So well, yeah, you, I know. You know, but, uh, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's, I don't think I came up on it. Like it was okay. the, like the Carol Burnett show was a yeah. massive influence. Uh, uh, Andy Griffith. Um, I remember seeing uh, uh, When Things Were Rotten. Do you remember that? Dude, I remember When Things Were Rotten so well. Yeah. That was the Robin Hood sitcom that was produced by Mel, Mel Brooks. Brooks. Yep. Uh, do you know my friend Portia? Remember my friend yeah, Portia, yeah. the tall redhead? Yeah, yeah. Her dad is David Sabin, who was Little John on that show. Oh, seriously? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, go back on, find the, the credits on YouTube. Yeah. With David Sabin as Little John. Yeah. Uh, Dick Van Patten as Friar Tuck. Yep. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I love that one. I loved, loved when things were rotten. I love Police Squad. Oh, I love um, Police Squad. So I think the early, like for me, like early comedy stuff was recognizing that adults can take, uh, take reality and flip it on its side and on its head and it's amazing and they can act like idiots and, and you will be celebrated for it. Yeah. You, you, you will get a reaction from people. And then I think as I, in, in high school, I started to get into like, artsy films, you know, and I think in all of those, I was really attracted to like, and I was like, oh, most of these subject matters are like really dark. Not there, there's no, there's no sort of like um, resolution or relief from it. Like we're just going to go into dark material. Well, like what? Like what were the, what were the movies? Well, like David Lynch, okay, like David Lynch stuff. It's just like, we're going to go into this world mm -hmm. and you're going to go with us. Mm -hmm. I had the same feeling about with comedy as like, you're going into this world, re like give into it. And there's something to, to the darker material, like the shining and stuff is like, mm -hmm. maybe horror. I mean, but it's like, yeah, in, you agree to go into this world and see what that experience is like. Well, I find that a lot of comedy nerds are also horror nerds to a certain extent because there's the same thing of like playing an audience in a very specific way mm -hmm. and trying to get a very specific reaction from them, whether it's a jump scare yeah. or a guffaw. Yep. Um, I think a, a lot of the same. Um, it's a lot of the same muscles, I think. Yeah, it it is. It's it's triggering an involuntary response. Yeah, you yeah, know, exactly. It, it's 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 flipping the switch on a synapse in someone's brain that they don't maybe have access to until that happens. And, and I will do that to you. Yeah. I will do. You won't do that to yourself. I will do that to yeah, you. Yeah, Speaking yeah. of darkness, you did amazing work, and I found out <clears throat> it's streaming on Amazon Onion News Network. Oh yeah, yeah. It's streaming on Amazon. <clears throat> Excuse me, and um. What I loved about the two seasons of that show was how deadpan it was and how it did, like, by not using a studio audience, it was able to satirize not just the news but the way the news was presented yeah. in a way that Daily Show couldn't even do, mm -hmm. you know, because it would take these really absurd premises and – the host was, I guess, an actual news anchor that they had just found, I guess. They would rotate different uh, hosts. Most of them were uh, New York City theater people. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They were just really good at They were hitting. amazing. And all of you guys, and you were one of the rotating talking head commentators yeah, on Yeah, Duncan it. Birch. Duncan Birch. Yeah. Who was, a, uh, you'd often have a different sense of expertise uh, depending on what the episode was about. Yeah. I can't recommend, if you're not familiar, it was on IFC? Was it on IFC? It was on IFC, and before that, they just did it on their website. Right. 
Um, so it started off as like just little interstitial things, and when they did the Onion News Network, it was on IFC. And it was it's so funny and so, so specific. Funny. And you're so good on it because everyone is just – there's no one is asking for the laughs. Everyone yeah. is just doing the stuff. But it came with a cost. Yeah. <laughs> it came with a cost, Brian Husky. <laughs> Talk to me about that Cue cost music. because Cue this music. is an interesting – this is an interesting um, – not parable, yeah. but it's an interesting uh, um, commentary on our media landscape. I think so. You had a you had that gig as a sort of recurring, and then you had a steady commercial gig at the time. Yes, yes, I had a steady. I had booked a campaign that was like a major campaign, like an ongoing juggernaut campaign for a fast food company, but it wasn't. They would mainly show the commercials like in the Midwest, in the South, a little bit on the coast, but that was the, the most of it. The chain is not particularly well represented in L.A. County. No, no. Um, and it was a fantastically amazing job because I got to – we got to improvise. It was mm-hmm. me and this uh, uh, talented performer from uh, Chicago, Second City, named Molly Erdman. We would just imp- – they'd give us scenarios and very sort of curb style. We would just improvise around the idea and be sure to say the product. Right. Um, and it was going great, and I think it would, like, have gone on for maybe two or three years. Wow. Just – and it saved – it's it like – it it moved the needle for me in terms of feeling like my life could advance because I was um, – with my – girlfriend at the time we were living together and I was kind of gun shy to get married because I didn't feel like I could provide anything Mm -hmm. so it allowed for that so it was going really great and we had finished some in the winter and they're like great we're going to do some more uh, come February so be available and in the interim I got this call they're saying like so they're gonna they're changing the campaign a little bit they're gonna you're not going to do it anymore, and they're going to pair Molly up with a woman. They they just want to go in a more female centric direction. And I was like, are they doing fast food with with feminine just, like just for women? Yeah, <laughs> just for women. Like I and I was very confused by it, and it didn't feel like the answer, like what they were telling me was what was happening. Um, long story short, the I'd done. One particular Onion News Network piece that was, and this was actually when it was it was before the TV show. Oh, this wow. was when it was. So it was an older piece. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this was wow. just this was just a video. This was just an online video. Um, that the joke was that they were making the Iraq War more handicap accessible, so that soldiers who were injured in battle could continue to fight until they were dead. And it was. The upshot of that is the Iraq war is exploiting soldiers. No, I get it. Yeah. It was not interpreted that way by some on some veteran who had a blog. I don't understand why he was doing this, but oddly enough, Rob Hubel contacted me, actor Rob Hubel, our mutual friend, yeah. contacted me and was like, hey, man, I was poking around some veterans blogs and I saw this. Po- <laughs> Rob Hubel, not Riggle. No, Rob Hubel. Hubel, okay. Um, and I was like, okay, I won't, well, yeah, everybody's got hobbies. And, and he was like, and I saw this post saying about those commercials and they're like, who's this guy? They're making fun of us. I don't know. Let's send, let's, let's take it down. So I guess they sent word to the company. To the fast food company. To the fast food company. And they were sort of like, oh, we don't want this heat. And it's so clearly making fun of the callous disregard of veterans. Right. Now, there's there's some things where, like, you know, you just can't make light of anything at all. Mm. Okay, I guess I hear that to a point. But the satire is not pointed at veterans yes. by any stretch. It is a very so, – you know, I, I don't get as political as you might expect on this show. I really yeah, don't. I, I, I'm very political in my day-to-day life, and I'm on social media. I like to take the break off – take this time off. But I promise you that motherfucker has issues about cancel culture. I yeah. promise you the guy who made that post thinks cancel culture is the worst thing that's ever happened. Yeah. Having canceled Brian Husky. Yeah, and it's – Or try to anyway. I, so at the time of that happening, I was – the fact that – 
I knew I was being lied to. Yeah. And I just wanted someone to say what was going on instead of lying to me. And I kept pushing and kept pushing. And my agent's like, you got to let this go. And I was like, I don't, this is not, you don't understand like what a big crushing blow this is for me financially, you know, ego, my understanding of like what I am as a performer, my stance, I came to, I was like, look, I know the kind of performer I am. I know the kind of stuff I do not for you. Um, so that's, that's who I want to be quote as an artist. And I need to be really clear with you guys about that. But you also need to be clear with me about what you are comfortable with of me doing outside of this job. Right. Like how much do you own this me is outside you, this, this? This is you talking to your commercial agents or? You yeah, talking, and, yeah. And talking to the, I finally sort of started to kind of push with the creatives because I was in better with them. And I just was saying like, look, I just really, this is what I want to, to, I just want a dialogue because I just sort of feel like I just, it's like, go, bye, you're out of here. I'm like, what, what I do, what I do. I don't understand what I right. do. Um, and I don't think I handled, I think I was, I think I, you know, <laughs> going back to my identified neediness, like there was a neediness I had that was off-putting to a lot of people. Um, but I just felt lied to and that just felt really confusing to me. Yeah, that's right. Um, and it, 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 since then, I, you know, I, I don't know, a few years after I was contacted by one of the creatives and he's like, I heard you talking about this on the podcast and it really, it, it it bugs me still. And I'm like, I'm really sorry. And we kind of unpacked it. Oh, wow. And resolved it and stuff. And I, this and is a guy from the agency, the ad agency. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because they were great. They're such cool dudes. They're usually the best guys on set. Yeah. You know, the client's awful. The director is at his wits end. And I, <laughs> and it's the kind of thing of now I'm like, I'm like, I get it. I totally, I totally understand why that happened. Right. You're like, I am, I am just, but a, you know, I'm the cherry on top of this cake that they're trying to sell. And they're like, oh, well, this cherry's getting old. Let's switch it. <laughs> and so, but, but it, but my, yeah, it was just, I just was so uncomfortable being, being lied to. And, and it wasn't, it was also not being acceptance of what was. It wasn't being acceptance of like, oh, you're dealing with a corporation. Like you're advertising for a corporation. Yeah. So you're an ad. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I was uncomfortable with that. And if I'm really honest about it, um, I was getting to the point where I was being, un I felt uncomfortable of being the, you know, insert fast food company name guy. Yeah, sure. People were referring to me as that. Uh huh. And it was around that time that the, the can you hear me now guy was becoming a thing. And I did not want that to happen for my career. Yeah. So if, you know, did, did you audition for Can You Hear Me Now? Yeah. Yeah, me too. Humiliating. I did like two or th I got like two or three callbacks. I think I was in the mix for that. Oh, fucker. really? Yeah. No, and I didn't. that guy, Paul, last name I can't remember, got it. Yeah. And on the one hand, I don't think I've seen him in anything else. On the other hand, I think he owns a house in Montauk. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, let's talk about. Um, that's a question we ask everybody on on the show. What was a uh, what was a role that got away? Oof. Um, there was a really big role that got away um, that I had a tough time accepting. Um, it was so I did uh, multiple seasons of uh, Veep. Yeah. Um, I played um, Leon West. Leon West, uh, and I. I was debating talking about this, but I won't say which part it was, but it was between me and one other actor for one of the main cast. It seemed for a period that the other actor who was attached to another show, they were going to let him go. So th I remember my rep saying- Wait, for which show? For Veep. For, oh, the, for the pilot of Veep. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So he was doing something else. I they weren't going to let him out of his contract. Um, and- so there was a period where they're like, okay, so he can't do it. Basically, you've got this part. And I was like, oh, but they still want you to come in and, and be there for the for the um, final auditions with people to kind of pair things up. Then it 
became like, well, they're just going to bring him in to audition just in case. I'm like, wait, so you mean the other person is now they're trying to get him out of the other thing? You're like, yeah, but it's 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 very unlikely. Fucking know what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's just and, you know, there are other people who are coming in for other parts and they had multiple uh, comp competitors. I had one. And I knew who they usually bring a few people in to test for these roles. And you know, yes. we've talked about the testing process on the show before, and it's laborious. It's gotten a little easier now because they usually do it on video. Mm -hmm. And that's even more the case now that we're we're everything's remote. But um, yeah, you you get down to the wire and you're sort of a finalist for you're in the finals for uh, yeah. for a particular part. Yeah, yeah. And it was um <laughs> It was terrifying. I will be completely candid and said that that morning it was uh, one of the, it was the only time in my life that I might have soiled myself. Okay, because <laughs> I was so nervous. It's so, it's so just a little tiny. No, yeah, squirt. Just a little like oh, oh okay, yeah, please, please. That's please. how nervous I am. Yeah, dude, dude. I had thirteen fruitless tests in a row. Yeah, thirteen network tests in a row that where I did not book. Yeah. Um. And um, I'll tell you, around eight or nine, you stop shooting yourself. I'll tell you, I'll tell you <laughs> that right so. now. Yeah, yeah, that 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 you kind of uh, you you uh, develop a certain intestinal fortitude. Yeah. Anyway, okay. So, yeah. So so it was. It, it, so did the did the callback? Armando Iannucci, who is a wonderful, fostering, nurturing director and creator, mm -hmm. came in and said. You are all here for a reason. There is something about each one of you that I find intriguing and I think would be um, a, a great asset to the world I'm building. If I don't find a part for you on, in this main cast, I will find a part for you in this series. And he was true to his word. Like, he came through. There wasn't much. I, I had – I was being offered what ended up being just uh, a one-time part Mm -hmm. uh, the, of the photographer it mm -hmm. went to uh i think patrick fischler did it oh, he's, patrick fischler, he's yeah. always so so good yeah. um and he was so he was so funny in it. but um I, I i was like i think i'm i i i wanted to wait i was like can i wait for something else like, yeah sure and i'm glad i did because leon goes on to he starts as an, an adversarial reporter and becomes press secretary by the last uh, season. Yeah. yeah, he's participating with the people that he hates. Yeah, and yeah. that's such a great arc. You get kidnapped in Iraq. Yeah, yeah, I get kidnapped in Iraq, and they hold me there because it, it will look better if she can come and rescue me than they if they just release me when I, I was due to be released. So they engineered this whole thing where they come in with Air Force One, and I find out that that's what they were doing on the way back. And Amazing. And that was a great— that was a great career experience for me because in shooting one of the scenes on Air Force One, that was at a point in the series where Julia was starting to recognize that they can't continue to have her be a buffoon right. as she's angling to become president. She's right. Like, she's not – she's gotten this far – because she's smart. Right. She's going to get further if she's smart, so she can't tolerate. You guys can all be dumb, but I'm not going to tolerate it. So she had them, like, we re reworked a scene, which is a great thing about Veep, is, like, they would. Very collaborative. Very collaborative. Accounts. And yeah. they, once they get on set, they're like, oh, this isn't working. Let's re I did one day on Veep as, a, uh, as part of a focus group for Jonah's ad. And oh, even right, my right. one day, I felt. And they was like, this is a straight offer. Go in. Don't fuck it up. Great. Right. Fine. Whatever. I'm yeah, here. Yeah. You know, literally it was the, the Paramount was right near where I lived. And um, even in my tiny little role, it was it felt like, oh, they they'll take my input. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. amazing. Yeah. 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 He's he's he, he, I saw him uh, take a suggestion from a, a dude at Crafty one time. That's gorgeous. He was just like, hey, what if he did this? He's like, this is very good. Thank you. And they they used it. That's like, incredible. So cool. So anyway, they. She's like, this isn't working. We need to fix this. The writers went at lunch, and lunch being at 11 p.m. because we're doing a night shoot, um, wrote an entirely new scene for, oh, wow. for me and Kevin Dunn. Yeah, I love Kevin Dunn. Three pages and just handed it to us. Fucking and was like, hell. here you go. You're going to shoot this now. And normally I would have been like, I would have gone back to my, my soiled moment, but I was like, okay, 
this is what it is and this is what we're doing and and Kevin was so great and I was like well this is happening is like at a certain point with the show you're just like it's always happening you don't don't worry about it so how do you um, you're handed three pages uh, hot off the press yeah do you tape it to Kevin Dunn's chest like how do you are you just sort of approximate the dialogue uh, we, you know? I don't know it was written in such a way I guess we had talked about what the scene was gonna be okay enough. So it wasn't completely a cold read. Yeah, it wasn't completely a cold read. And we had sort of so we sat in with them while they were writing during uh, the lunch and talked about what needed to happen. So I think that just gave me enough. And my guy was uh, Leon was just sort of like name checking all the steps they took to get him to this place. And then Kevin Dunn's part of it was he was severely exhausted. Like he had jet lag. So he, he could just barely get through the conversation. So it was like me hammering at him. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, it, it wasn't sort of like, um, mammoth or anything. Right, right, right. You, yeah. you could kind of, you, you were in it. Yeah. You, yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. It was just basically recounting your, your character's story. Yeah. Um, another great nervous character is, Reginald Murgatroyd on the X Files, mm -hmm. um, the 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 uh, from the the reboot episode of the Lost Art of Forehead Sweat, yeah. um, which um, is is sort of classic husky. You know, it's just it's just really good stuff. Yeah, you were a fan of the show, right? Kind of. Okay. Yeah, I maybe I'll just say no, but I was okay. kind of. Yeah, uh, it's funny, like people assume that you like if you're in a show a lot of times they're like oh you must have loved this show for years and i was like i kind of right. I, I felt like i should have right, right sure 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 to sort of, because i wrote I, I i was very aware of like what an institution it is i mean you because of the nature of that episode you are photoshopped into the credits <laughs> Of the show, yes, of those iconic credits. I know that you know. So it's a, it's kind of a huge, and it is funny how people assume they're like, "Oh my god, you must be so psyched to be on blank." And I'm like, "Yeah, my yeah. episode was the first one I ever watched." Right, you know, yeah, I've, I've been there. I've absolutely completely. been there. Um, but it's um, you. The episode's about the Mandela effect, and you might be a crazy person who insists he was partnered mm -hmm. with Scully and Mulder, so they. They edit you into past episodes. Yeah. It is a real, it's a fan favorite. Yeah. Because it's a, it's sort of a, it's one of the more satirical or um, not satirical, self-aware episodes yeah. of The X-Files. Yeah, it's a very meta episode. And, that, and the guy who wrote it and directed Darren Morgan, like that's his specialty within the X-Files world. He, he did all this sort of like weird one-off funny ones. The deconstructions yeah. and like there's one where they do a um, where they're in a where there's a movie based on them I think. I think yeah. that might be his as well. Um, so what was that? Did you shoot that uh, here or was that up in Vancouver? That was in Vancouver. Vancouver. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, what was that experience like? Because it's so much of it is just the three of you. It's yeah. just you, David, and Gillian Anderson. Yeah. Okay. First off, what accent does Gillian Anderson use between scenes? She she lets it drop. She goes back to her her native Brit. She's not native British. She's, she's not. What is she? She's from the Pacific Northwest. No, she she went to high school in Britain, and she um she has since moved back there, and she's kind of reappropriated the accent. She's not from England. Well, it was light enough that I was like, oh, I guess maybe she's. At first, I thought she was from New England, and I was like, that's a little bit of English. So that's funny. No, she doesn't go back. She can go back to shit. Yeah. She, <laughs> she goes back to this thing that she started doing in her third, whatever. Anyway, yeah. um, I love her to pieces. She's, you know. Maybe she I, had to go back and work on it. We're entering my, you know, my, she was getting ready to play Margaret Thatcher, I guess. So that's fine. But yeah. we're, I mean, listen, we're still entering, you know, the fourth decade of my crush on the woman. But, <laughs> but the accent is a striking thing. And I will um, say more attractive now than when she was baby faced. Mulder. Like, oh, yeah, no, she's she's stunning. Scully, like, you monster. Boy. Oh, yeah, you're she's right. Scully. Sorry. See, that's <laughs> how much monster. I love this you series. In great. <laughs> I'm a big fan. <laughs> big fan of the series. <laughs> we love Spinal Tap, not you guys, but just the whole yeah. rock Same. genre in general. Uh, <laughs> the, um, uh, but so you're with these two guys who have worked together for a quarter century. Mm. Um, you're dropped in on this iconic show. Did you feel welcomed? Was it? Was it? How? What was the vibe like? Well, we we shot 
all of our like super sexy location scenes were done in a parking, parking deck, garage. Right? Yeah, right. So it's just uh, off the bat, you're like, well, we're in a gross environment. So this, there's no pretense of sort of like status is taken away a little bit that right way, you know what right because I mean? you're right. just like are you going to sit by this post or that post <laughs> and then but i was aware that so Duchovny was pretty welcoming to a degree off the off the bat and uh jillian anderson was a little a little more intrepidatious okay. and then as i hung out with them and made them laugh Great. and show that I was not insane. Right. They started to kind of warm up to me. Yeah, that's usually the case. And if you're then, lucky, you have that kind of time to build that and show them that, hi, I'm not crazy. I'm your yeah. coworker. And also, I would just be like, you know, if I got the vibe that they were just doing their thing and just let them do their thing. Right, you know? right, right. Um, but yeah, we got into some. Uh, conversations about relationships, me and Duchovny. Which really? Was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which, it, when that was happening, I was like, this is gold. What is happening right now to me? Wow. Yeah. Like, wh- I mean, okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah fair yeah. enough. Hey, I'm not going to kiss. I guy, won't pry. No, I don't know. Listen, no, no, no. that's between you and, uh, that's between you and Fox say, Mulder. If you cross me, I, this is coming out. So. Yeah. 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 If your company ever, ever does you wrong, coming you're going to, you're going to, you're going to spill the tea. Yeah. Okay. We look forward to that. We'll have you back. We'll yeah. have you back. But, um, uh, but so, but then at the end, I think by the end of it, um, there had been, there were a few, there, there was a couple of little sort of like, uh, star moments that happened on set that I was not privy to, but I heard about. Okay. Um, and so by the end of it, we had our last thing where it's like this green screen shot, and it's supposed to look really like janky 60s. Oh, yeah. It's, it's supposed to look like you guys are basically in, in, in 66 Batman kind yeah, of. Totally. Yeah, yeah. And he was like overdriving and yeah, stuff. Yeah. Um, that was my last scene with them. Interesting. And, and it was like, cut. The company just took off, didn't say goodbye. And it, he wasn't. It, it, and I'm not saying that he was the the, the problem or anything, but there's just something I was like, oh, okay, we had our time together, and he's moved on to <laughs> to the next to the next thing. Uh, that was our moment. And, yeah. Totally. Uh, okay. Great. Yeah. Your your money's on the dresser, Brian. <laughs> but this is sort of going back to uh, circling back to like earlier feelings I would have of like, oh, but wait. Isn't there more? There has got got to be more. I'll hold on to it if there's not more. I was like, oh, okay. There's right. All right. Yeah. See you later. <laughs> yeah. And you were able to be like, okay, that's it, and that was great. Yeah. And I enjoyed that moment, and I stayed in that moment. Totally. And on to the next moment. Yeah. And the next moment for you is American Born Chinese. You've got a few uh, right episodes now, of that. Yeah. I just finished finished those. There was they're like. There's two episodes and then two sort of like blips, you know, okay. just like little, uh, you, you see my face. Um, but the last episode was pretty cool because I got to do some wire work. And, oh, my God. Yeah. Which is sounds great. It's basically being in a like a torture diaper. No, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I was flown once for something, and my crotch has never fully recovered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, they really it's, – it's amazing how much of the – the Hong Kong economy is built on wire work, yeah. considering how co- uncomfortable it is. <laughs> yeah, completely. <laughs> but yeah, but so um, you did some wire work. Did you get to work with Michelle Yeo? No. Oh, okay. No. But I worked with, and I w- this is something I'm terrible at. I don't, I'm not great with names, but <laughs> I apparently worked with like one of Hong Kong's top, top, top uh, fight coordinators. Oh my God, really? And he was the guy who sort of like, coach me through like okay so you're gonna pull the the thing from behind you and then snap your arms and switch your legs and then you're gonna kind of come swooping like swooping in and he was very patient with like how stiff and 50s i am (laughs) i absolutely cannot wait to see this yeah brian husky thank you so much for doing this john bow i love you love you too thanks for having me and that is an episode wrap on Brian Husky. You can find him at the Brian Husky on both Instagram and Twitter, and he will be on the show American Born Chinese, which is coming very soon to a screen in your house.